Very good. Let's let's pray. Well, Father, we uh, we're so um, thankful to be able to gather around your word and uh, have it read to us, be able to consider and reflect on what you have so carefully given to us down through the centuries. We we thank you for it. We pray, please, tonight that you would help us to think on it now with great care. Uh, please um, work in this room by your Holy Spirit, please, to uh, give us attention and uh, give us uh, concentration to think clearly, but please send us out of this place changed and transformed, we ask, and we ask it in Jesus' name, Amen. Well, we're dealing again with very big issues tonight, I want to ask you, if you were able to run the universe, if you were in charge, if you had the power to do whatever you wanted to do in the universe, uh, what would you do? What would you do with the problem of evil? What would you do with all the oppressive people, the hateful people, the uh, abusive people? What would you do with all of them? Well, if you were God, uh, if you had that kind of power, I dare say every one of us would, would do what? We'd get rid of them, wouldn't we? We'd get rid of those people. If you had the power to stop cancer, you'd do it in a shot, wouldn't you? If you had the power to um, stop domestic violence, bang, done. Or if you had the power to stop war, wouldn't you do it? Um, these are the kinds of things, surely, we'd, we'd do it immediately. And so, if that's how we would act, doesn't it raise a question for us, a problem for us, perhaps you haven't thought about it, but doesn't it raise a how come God hasn't done it? He's meant to have the power. How come he hasn't ended war? How come he has, hasn't ended abuse, cancer? death, disease, how come he hasn't got rid of these things? In amongst all of that is the suggestion I'm offering, which, which I think is probably a little bit in our hearts, do you know what, if we were God, we'd do things differently? If we were God, I wouldn't have the world the way it was, the way it is. Have you ever thought that? In the quiet of your heart, in the quiet of your mind, have you wondered why he's doing what he's doing? How come he lets this happen? Um, Many of us have thought that and, and particularly kind of as you go on in life and stuff happens to you, you become the victim of uh, some terrible abuse or uh, disease or someone you love close to you uh, it dies or gets cancer or something. Um, at that point, almost everyone goes through this time where they go, why God? Why did you let this happen? And buried in that question is, why did you let this happen in that there can be no good reason for it and therefore I ought, you ought not have this. You, you should be stopping this. Why, why don't you make this not be? Why are you doing this? And it got buried in that thinking is, yes, if I could believe there was a good reason, if I could think up a good reason why it might be worthwhile having this terrible thing occur, I could understand you doing it, God, but I can't think of any good reason why you let this happen. So what's with it? Most people go through that. It's the classic... Um, it's the classic comment of a war veteran, someone who's been in the front lines of the war effort, uh, who comes back um, no longer going to church, giving up on Christian faith, giving up on a faith in God. And you ask them why and they say, look, if you've seen the things I've seen, the dreadful evils that I've seen, uh, how could you ever believe in God again, who lets that kinds of things happen? It's a very classic position that people take. Um, you know, the, the point is, we, we may not all have many answers in life, we may not know much about the ups and downs of life, but most of us are pretty sure God's doing it wrong. And if we were God, we'd do it differently. Well, all of that is what Job speaks to, the book of Job. All of that's what we're going to tackle tonight. Because I want to suggest to you that the chapters that we're focusing on tonight, the last chapters of the book, near the end of the book, um, that is one of the big points that these chapters make. It helps us think about why evil, what's happening, how come God's doing it, how we might do it differently, why do we think like that? All of that kind of issue is what we're going to tackle tonight because this is the week that God speaks. If you've been with us over this last bunch of uh, weeks as we're going through the book of Job, uh, there'll be this kind of impatience, do you know, we've, um, we've seen all kinds of things and we've been waiting and waiting for God to finally say something, well he does tonight, tonight's the time we look at those chapters and I want to suggest to you, I want to say to you, it's actually, as we do this, it's going to be humbling, terrifying but take it to heart, it's deeply and profoundly humbling 
and my hope is that we'll get there together tonight. Let me give you some of the context. Uh, we'll be looking, uh, come with me to Job chapter 38, grab your Bibles and look there. Let me give you the context as you're flipping into that place. Um, you remember Job has been suffering, he's experienced natural disaster that took all of his family. He's experienced evil, the evil of uh, uh, aggressive, violent men who have come against him and destroyed so many. Uh, he's experienced all of that and health, he's suffering his health. Now we know why that's happened, because the first two chapters of Job tell us why and it's got nothing to do with his sin. It's not because he's sinful, the first two chapters make that very clear. But then chapter after chapter from uh, those first two chapters, we get this conversation between, debate really, argument between Job and a group of friends who came to help him, but it really goes south as they start to do that, because they argue with each other, they try and explain to Job why God has brought this upon him. And the friends of Job uh, get it all wrong. They insist that if you're suffering, Job, it must be because of sin in your life. You may not be able to see it, but there's some secret sin that God's judging you for it, and that's the system they operate with. Suffering means you've sinned. And Job says, no, Job, this argument goes back, Job says, I haven't, I can't see it. Yeah, I'm not perfect, but I've been righteous and blameless, and I've been God-fearing, and I can't see that I've done anything to deserve this. Yes, you have, you must have, because any suffering means that back and forward they go. But we know from the very start that it's got nothing to do with their sin, with Job's sin. The counsellors are wrong. And then we see Job spiralling. Do you remember, he starts well, he has that beautiful sense of piety where he says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And he rests himself in the sovereign hand of God. Shall we not receive good only, but also uh, trouble? He rests in God, it's a beautiful start. But then as the days, weeks and months of suffering goes on, chapter 3, chapter 4 emerges with his despair, his grief, his distress... And he starts to lose the plot. And you see him sink into a kind of rage against God. He maintains his faith, but down he sinks. And then he comes up again. He looks to his Redeemer one day and he has this great confidence, but then he sinks back down again. It's up and down, up and down. Let me actually just offer some pastoral observations quickly. This just to remind you of some important truths. First thing, just two. Don't assume that all your thinking about what God is like and why He's doing what He's doing in the world is right. Job's friends got it wrong. They were, they were deeply concerned to honour God, but they got it wrong. Um, don't assume that your instincts about how God must be and how the world works are right. You've got to keep coming back to the Bible and letting God's Word itself teach you how to think about God. Just be very cautious about your bold statements that are not grounded in the Scriptures. Come back to the Bible, work hard at that. Not all theology is true theology, first thing. Second thing, beware of a kind of hyper-spirituality, a kind of view of the spiritual Christian life that imagines that if you're a genuine Christian, you can sail through life triumphant, successful, as a winner, Always positive, always upbeat. Job tells you that's not the case. Job is the best of men and uh, he is honoured by God and he goes through a very great journey. There's, there's truth and beautiful expressions of his heart for God, but there's the down, the pit, the despair, the, the grief, the anxiety and that's normal. That's normal. One day stuff will come against you and, and you'll be taken on this journey yourself. And if you find yourself crying out to God and, and railing against Him and why, in the midst of that, if you keep your faith in God, give yourself space to be honest with God. Give yourself room to go through the ups and downs. Pray for strength to press on, but don't beat yourself up if you end up like Job, in the pit, back up again and down again. Don't beat yourself up, give yourself space. God uh, can cope with your honesty. Pastoral observations. In all of this, Job never loses his faith, though not all that he says is good. Much of, some of what he says he needs to repent of, he gets it quite wrong. In the midst of his suffering, he says things that are deeply problematic. And let me show you one of them, I've asked you to turn to Job 38, but come back to 31, just for a moment, Job 31. 
Let me show you one of the very problematic things that Job says. Job 31, verse 35. Oh, that I had someone to hear me. Where are you, God? I sign now my defence. Let the Almighty answer me. If only there was someone out there, God, who would listen to me, I sign my defence, that is, I sign the reasons why I'm being treated unjustly by God and let the Lord Almighty answer my charge against him. That's what he's saying. Let the accuser put his indictment in writing. Verse 37, I would give him an account of my every step. I would prove that I'm in the right, is effectively what he's saying. And I would present it to him. Now, it's interesting here, the ESV um, uh, states it like this. I would present it to him as a prince. And what the ESV is trying to capture is the sense most likely that what Job is saying. I would come to God as a great one, as a prince who is right and cause him to actually defend himself against me. Now, do you see the shift that's occurred here? Early on in chapter 2, he says those beautiful statements about the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. He bows before the sovereign hand of God and submits to the King. But now, after months of suffering and grief, he says, Lord, you come and defend yourself for what you've done against me. I am righteous and innocent. This is unfair. It's unjust. What have you got to say for yourself, God? The shift that has occurred here is that in the best of men, and Job is, in the shaking of the sufferings that he's been enduring, pride has come to the surface. He's been able to hide it for a period of time, but it's there waiting to come. And if I could use an illustration of a bottle, imagine a... um, a bottle of uh, water that's just been sitting for a long, long period of time and the fluid inside is very clear. Just, it's, it's a bottle of water. It's, it's clear. But you pick it up and you move it around and suddenly it goes cloudy. Why does it go cloudy? Because at the bottom of the bottle, while it had been sitting still, the dirt had settled to the bottom and it was sitting as a sediment on the bottom. But with the shake, it actually comes up from the top. It was always in the bottle. It was always in the water. It just came out of it, but now it's back in it. There is Job's heart. When Job was in the place of ease and comfort and all going well, he was settled. And the pride that was in his heart hid itself in the sediments of his life. But in the midst of suffering, it was shaken up. And so what was there emerges, the pride that was always there. And let me just offer again a pastoral observation. That is every human heart. We look really good. We look like clear water when things are plain sailing. When life is peaceful and things are happy and we're getting what we want and we need, we're polite, we're smiling, we're respectful, it's all very beautiful. Society is all very beautiful until you put it under pressure, until you put a person and shake them in suffering. And then what is really in the heart comes to the surface and is seen. Don't don't measure people around you and your own heart when it's happily cruising. That's not when you see the real you. You see the real you in the midst of suffering and turmoil and despair. That's what comes to the surface. And so finally, after ignorance upon ignorance of human thought, the friends of Job mouthing error and foolishness and Job being driven to speak things that come out of his pride after people have said what they've said is sure is happening and Job demands that God speaks to him, God finally speaks. And what he says is, it's shattering. Let me take you through the shattering tonight. Come to chapter 38. Verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm, out of the whirlwind, out of the storm that terrifies and shows power beyond. And the Lord speaks out of that, positions God at the beginning of this 
as the one who comes to him in all his power. And he drives it further forward there in verse 3. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. Wow. Do you see the tone here? The beginnings of God speaking to Job is not the soft and gentle God, the mother with her child, being all warm and gooey. This is the absolute sovereign of the universe, the majestic warrior God, the power. And he says to the man, and I'm making a point of using the masculine, the man, it's in there in the, in the language of the Hebrew, it's, he says to the man for him to brace himself like a man. And the idea is the sense of a a man who is about to get pummeled by a warrior against him. And he's to gird up his loins, ready to stand against the battle that comes. This is God tackling someone at their strength or perceived strength. This This is not how God speaks to the frail and the weak and the lowly. This is how God speaks to the pretentious, the proud and arrogant. And he says, brace yourself. And what follows is a list of 77 questions thrown at Job, one after the other. He pummels him with these questions again and again. And none of them expect an answer. They're they're known as a rhetorical question, a question that's asked without expecting an answer, or at least we know what the answer should be and doesn't need to be said. But God just pummels him again and again and again. And what happens in the midst of this is a great reversal. Job had required God to answer him. Now, God says, let man answer me. Now, the 77 questions range across across all of creation, from the heights to the details. He talks about the planets, the oceans, the weather, the stars, the animals, under the oceans, in the oceans, and so on. And it's full of sarcasm. Now, sarcasm is not an attractive thing. It's not something we ought to use with each other. But for God to use it in this context is entirely appropriate. Let me give you a sense of it. Come with me to verse 4. Here we go. Let's start. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. Where were you, Job, when I created the universe? Oh, that's right. You weren't there. I was. Do you understand what happened then? Oh, you don't, do you? But I do. Do you see the tone of it? You come to verse uh, 8. Who shut up the sea behind the doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness. When I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place. When I said, this far you may come and no farther. Who shut up the seas behind their doors? Who did that, Job? Was it you? No, that's right. It wasn't you, was it? You weren't even there. You don't know how to do it. I'm the one who did it. That's right. You see there, come with me to verse 17, just race our way through. Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest, darkest? Have you seen those, Job? Actually, no, you haven't, have you? But I have. I I created the world. I set the oceans in place. I know the depths of darkness. You don't. Have a look there with me at verse 18. Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all of this. That's right, you don't, do you? Your mind is limited. You know a few things. I know everything. You come there at verse 19. What is the way to the abode of light? And where does darkness reside? Can you, can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you are already born. You've lived so many years. No, that's right. You've only lived 50. You've got no clue about this kind of thing. But I, the Eternal One, have been here forever. Tell me if you know. Come over to verse 33, just again to give a quick taste. Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? He's just been talking about, uh, you'll see there in verse 31, he's been talking about the stars and the constellations. And he's effectively saying, do you know what rules and controls? Do you know the laws of heaven that make the stars do what they do? Can you set up the dominion of God over the earth? No, you can't. You don't know and you can't. You know, we could go on and on and it's worth doing it. 
but time will get away from us for tonight. The point of all of this, in the vast reality of the cosmos, in relation to the depths of things on our own planet, in terms of the powers that rule and control the heavens, the stars, the lightning, the powers, Job knows nothing. We are nothing. We don't have the power to control these things. We don't have the wisdom to understand these things. And humans in their pretentiousness might learn some things and science might teach us more and more things, but we know 0.0001% of what is knowable, let's say. As we learn more, we learn more that we don't know. We ought not be proud in our science, but actually aware of the limitations we have as we learn more and more. And God brings this sarcasm against the pretentiousness of humanity that thinks in our few short years we can somehow master. God says these things to him in the big and then then in the intimate and the small. Have a look at chapter 39. Do you know where the mountain goats give birth? Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Do, 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 you know, do you know in all the mountains around the world the goats that are giving birth? No, you don't. But I do. I'm there with all of them. Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Or, no, you don't. But I do. Do you count the months till they bear? Do you know the time when they'll give birth? Every single one of them. You might know one or two or ten. I know all of them, all through history. God is expressing his intimate engagement with every detail of these things. Look at verse 19. Do you give the horse its strength or clothe its neck with a flowing mane? No, you don't. You don't do either of those things, but I do. You look then, uh, come a little bit further down, uh, verse 26. Does the hawk take flight by your wisdom and spread its wings towards the south? Is it your wisdom that enables the hawk to do what it does? No, it's not. I'm the one that brings an extraordinary wisdom to the the rule of all the features of the universe. That's me, I do that. Verse 27, does the eagle soar at your command and build its nest on high? No, but it does at my command. Notice this too in all of these questions. God is, um, he could just state it, I do, I do, I do. But there's a power to actually asking Job whether he does. Because God's making a couple of points here. He's making the point that not only does he do all of these things, but we don't. We can't. We are just for a moment, limited and frail. We don't have the power, notice these two words, we don't have the power to do these things and we don't have the wisdom to do these things. They are totally beyond us. So chapter 40, the Lord finally says to Job, there's two speeches God gives to Job, this is the first one. The Lord says to Job, will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer. And then Job answers the Lord and says, I am unworthy, how can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth, I shut up. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, I will say no more. And right there is the beginning of wisdom. The beginning of wisdom is to fear the Lord, is to have a right appreciation of His vastness, His greatness, His glory, His majesty, His otherness. And that is the beginning of wisdom. God is sovereign over all things and rules all things. Let me just again make another aside. I want to come back to the main thing in a moment. There's a very big thing I want us to get to. But um, I just want you to think with me. If someone's going to understand the truth about God and relate rightly to God, I'm going to suggest you there's two things you need to know about God. I don't know if you can think just for a moment, what might those two things be? What are the two big, two big don't say anything, but what are, the, what are the two big things a human, a person needs to know to rightly relate to God? What are the two big things? Just think what you might say there, don't say it. 
Let me tell you what I think the two big things are. I think they're the big truths of the Bible. The first thing humanity needs to know about God is this, that He's a God of love. He is love. It's not just that He does loving things, but His very perfection is that He cannot but be love. He is, he is love. That is the great glory of God, that He's a God of grace, mercy and love. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Love is a beautiful thing, it's a powerful truth about God deep in His very being, it's who He is, love, you need to know that about God. But I'll tell you the other truth that you need to know, humanity needs to know. It's the truth of Job 38 and 39. That God is wholly other. That He is the Creator, we're the creature. He is infinite in power, in wisdom, in understanding. He's eternal. He is omniscient. He is spirit. He is everywhere. He's the great, majestic I am God. He is self sufficient. He needs nothing and no one. All of life comes from Him. It doesn't, He doesn't gain life from somewhere else. He is this in Himself. You need to know that's about God that you might appreciate the distance between us and God, how far above He is, how extraordinarily powerful He is. You need to know that about God. Why? Why? Because there's no competition between us and God. You, 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 you cannot come to God as an equal. The beginning of wisdom is to know this, that I'm a mere creature, I'm the clay in the hand of the potter. Knowing that is critical because you can't win against this God. But I tell you why else you need to know that truth. To properly understand love. The, the, the popular Christianity does talk a lot about the love of God and it's a beautiful thing to talk about. But almost always in popular Christianity, the understanding of the love of God is a weak and pale thing. It's the love of God meaning He's a nice God. He, he's a God who... He's like a grandfather who always smiles when you come in the door and he's just a happy God. And People in our day and age, spiritual people, will have visions of God. And their visions of God are almost always about the warmth of God enfolding us and the acceptance that God has for everybody. He never discriminates against everybody. He's just for everybody. He's a loving, kind God. It's a beautiful picture. It's just not true. It's turned love into this insipid thing, which changes nobody and nothing. But here's the deal. When you understand the fact that God is wholly other, He is the sovereign, majestic, ruler over all, who, who speaks to humble and destroy, He is the great... When you understand that truth, when you have it deep in your heart, when you have a sense of fear and awe at the majesty of God, when you have that, and then you read John 3.16 that says, That God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. That changes everything. It means the love that God has is not a soft and sentimental thing. It is an astonishing thing. That the Creator of everything, the powerful God, should love us is mind-blowing. It is life-changing. Popular love language about God just makes you feel warm. It doesn't change your life. But to understand the truth of Job 38 and 39 about God and to find that that God loves you, which changes everything. Amazing love. Life-transforming and profound. And strong a strong love, a powerful love. There's a theologian many years ago who made the point that we ought to speak less about the love of God and more about the holiness of God, more about the great majestic truth and righteousness of God. We ought to speak less about the love of God, more about the holiness of God. And he said, because if we spoke less about the love of God, more about the holiness of God, when we then did speak about the love of God, we'd mean much more by it. The holy love of God that you have been loved by the Creator of the universe. 
is a thing that's mind-blowing. How precious and profound. Hey, that's not the big thing. You can't help but say something about it. Let's come back to it. You see, it's not enough. When you come to chapter 40, the first speech has ended. Job has been brought to put his hand over his mouth, uh, be humbled. But then look at verse 6. The Lord speaks again. He goes through the whole cycle again. The Lord spoke to Job again out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. He does the whole thing again. Now why? Well, there's a few reasons. The first one is that the lesson is so important to learn and so hard to learn for proud humans that God comes back at it again. It takes time for a sinful person to realise their, hum- their humility before God, that they're, that the fact that we're clay and he's the potter. It's a very hard lesson to learn. And so God comes back at it again. He takes time to teach this lesson. And the chapter moves forward in teaching this lesson, this time by focusing on a couple of creatures, um, the, the behemoth and the leviathan in chapter 41. And some people have suggested the, the behemoth is, is a hippo and the leviathan's a crocodile. And there's lots there that suggest they are, but there's lots there that doesn't fit. One breathes fire. And so I think the, the more accurate answer is that both creatures are a kind of a amalgam of um, mythical spiritual creatures that represent evil. And we haven't got time to explore it, but I, th- I think when you see what I'm about to show you, that makes more sense. Anyway, he, he pursues the great two creatures. But the heart of it is in verse 8. And here's the big thing for tonight. It's verse 8. Let me show you this. Verse 7. Brace yourself like a man, I'll question you, you shall answer me. Verse 8. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Now that's a new thought in God speaking to Job. Now, for the first time, he draws attention to what Job has said. He says, "Would would you condemn me to justify yourself? Would, would you make yourself look good, I'm innocent, in such a way that you've condemned me to be, the, to be the, wrong, the one who's doing the wrong thing because you're innocent? Would you set yourself up to bring me down? That's what he's saying. Well, what does God... This takes us actually to the heart of Job's issue, his pride. Uh, it's the sediment, you remember, that comes to the surface, the pride of Job, who justifies himself and brings God down. How many people do that in our world today? who look around at evil and suffering and say, I can't believe in a God who allows these things because look at how good we are. And so we justify ourselves and bring God down. Well, this is the issue that God is going to tackle. Look at his answer. Verse 9. Do you have an arm like God's arm? And can your voice thunder like his? Well, then adorn yourself with glory and splendour, clothe yourself in honour and majesty... And unleash the fury of your wrath on the proud to bring them low. Look at all who are proud and humble them. Crush the wicked where they stand. Now let me just make sense of this for us. Um, if you have a strong arm like God, then, then adorn yourself with glory, honour and majesty. Uh, show yourself to be glorious like God is by punishing the wicked. That's what's being said here. If, if, if you have an arm like God, then you'll be able to deal with evil in the world, Job. You, you should put on glory and majesty and make yourself majestic, because that's what the majestic, holy, righteous God would do. He'd punish evil. You should do what I should do and punish evil, deal with it. Show yourself to be glorious by destroying the wicked, the proud, the evil. Verse 13, bury them in all the dust together, shroud their faces in the grave, punish them. Verse 14, then I myself will admit to you that your own right hand can save you. Did you see what God's saying? If you think you're so great that you're, you're the great one who knows how things should be done in this world, how evil should be crushed and the proud destroyed, well, put, put on your strength like me, be glorious and majestic like me and do it. Let's see you do it. And then I'll admit that your right hand can save you. 
But the point is, you can't. Job has suffered at the hand of the evil in the world. But what God gets to at this point is, you actually don't know how to deal with evil. You think you do, but you don't. See, let me explain. These two speeches work together. The first speech is effectively God saying, you don't have power or wisdom to actually control the physical stuff of the universe. You can't manage that. And now you come to the second speech, chapter 40. And God is saying, just as you're totally out of your depth, you lack the power and the wisdom to know how to control the physical universe, you are completely out of your depth with evil. You, you, you think you know what should be done, but you don't have a clue about how to treat the proud, the evil, the wicked of the world. You don't know how to deal with evil. You are completely out of your depth. So your criticisms of me and my handling of evil, you've got no idea. And here we get to the depths of the book of Job. Are you with me? I don't want you to lose this. The book of Job is not just about humbling men and women to put them in their place. But rather, it is that. But it's a stinging rebuke to any person, man or woman who by complaining about particular events in life, imply that they could tell God how to do a better job with evil or how to run the universe. You see, here's the thing, and I want to spend just a moment on this. We think we know how to deal with evil in the world. We think we know how to make the world a better place. That's what the whole mood for the last 10 years has been. We've worked out how to make the world a better place. We want to make it a better place. And I've just done some research today on how to make the world a better place. I googled how to make the world a better place. That's where you go, isn't it, right? To find out how to do this. And here, here you go. No, there's a hundred things you've got to do to make the world a better place. Number three, carry stress balls. So when you get really stressed, you can pump the ball and you'll feel better and not be hurtful to others. Here we go. Number six, pay people compliments. That'll change the world. Number seven, tell someone that their shirt label is out when you don't know who they are. Look around, that's how to make the world a better place. Uh, volunteer for things. Give to a charity. When you go to the movies, turn your phone off. Make the world a better place. Will these things make... Well, there's 80 others that you can look at as well. Will this make the world a better place? Oh. Now, forgive me, forgive me, this is an old, grumpy man talking to you, all right? I, um, I, I've lived a bunch of years now and I've seen these things come and go and it just will not work. Think with me, will all of that help us get rid of Putin and Russia's aggression? Pay compliments to him. Be nice, tell him his label's sticking out and make him put it back in. Will that help us get rid of evil rulers and despots and tyrants like Putin? No, no, they'll laugh and they'll just annex another country. How do you stop that? How do you stop abusive people who, who don't care about how you smile at them and are nice to them? They'll just roll right over you. How do you stop that happening? How do you stop hateful people? The list of things, that, that stuff just doesn't touch that kind of problem. Uh, um, and even if you did that hundred things, would it make the world a better place? No, I'll tell you why not, because you couldn't do them. Do you know how few people volunteer? We all tell each other we should do this and we should give money to charity. Australians give pittance to charity. We tell them they should do it more, they'll do it less. You tell them to volunteer more, they'll just go and play Netflix more. It, it, the world does not work like this because there's something wrong in the human heart. And you don't see that until you know history. Do you know, in the early 1900s, uh, 1914, there was a war started, which was the war to end all wars. We, we thought, this war was so dreadful, it'll never happen again. Well, from there was the Second World War, which was even worse. And then we've had more wars since then than has ever happened. This stuff does not make... Singing a song that with our two hands will not make the world a better place. It's the naivety of young people 
in our world, well, not young and old, the romance that thinks that the human heart can be fixed by just being nice to each other. If we make schools teach kids how to be nicer, then we'll all grow up nicer. Naive. Have you heard the joke about lawyers? What do you do if you educate a thief? You don't get a nicer person, you get a lawyer. Have a think about that one. But the... Friends, it doesn't work like that. If we just keep saying to people to be nice and, and they won't do it. But what, okay, let's shame them if they don't do nice things. And do you know what happens when you start shaming people who don't do nice things? You create another tyrant. It's called the celebrity class, who just become tyrannical Puritans who force the people around them to do what they should do and not do it themselves. The world is deeply messed up. Now, what I'm saying is not very inspiring, is it? Much more inspiring to say we can do this together. But God's word to Job is, if you can pull us off, if you can, if you can get your voice to thunder and adorn yourself with glory and splendour and unleash your fury, bring all the proud down, then I'll say your own right harm has saved you. But you know what, Job, you can't, it won't, it won't happen. Pessimism. Because there are some things terribly wrong with our world that cannot be made right by what we do, what we do. Do you know we've made poverty better? But what we've done in the process is create more greed and materialism. We, we have got less male oppression of women, praise God. But what we've got is more women deeply dissatisfied with their life. We've got the reports of women, there is... There is a higher incidence of depression and unhappiness amongst women at the very time they should be the most. It's an extraordinary thing. Do you know what it's like? It's like a, build, a, a room which is full of evil, dirt on the floor. And we've, we can do a pretty good job of sweeping it out of one corner. But all we do is sweep it into another corner because evil just continues in our world. We can move it and shift it, but it stays there. Pessimism, I know, but truth, reality... Deeply important that we appreciate. You see, where do we land with all of this? Job chapter 39, chapter 40, 41. The great truth is God is God. He is God, you're not. But there's a new truth that's emerging and here it is. It's, it's the otherness of God, here it is, who alone has the power and wisdom to deal with evil to truly eradicate evil? Let me give you three questions. How is it possible to eradicate evil, to humble the proud and crush the wicked, and yet not create a power that becomes a new tyrant? How is it possible to crush evil and not create another power that becomes evil itself? Do you know how to do that? I don't know how to do that. No one's pulled it off in history. Second question. How is it possible to eradicate evil and yet still save some who are evil? How do you get rid of evil from every human heart and yet save some of those who have evil in their heart? Do you know how to do that? I don't know how to do that. Third. How is it possible to eradicate evil and ensure it never comes back again? Do you know how to do that? Job, do you know how to do that? I don't know how to do that. But God does. Deep buried in this is the heart of God who is preparing Job for something he, he never lived to see. But the resolution to evil in the world, the defeat of sin and Satan and death that only God could do in a way that justifies him as holy, makes forgiveness available to sinners and means sin will never come back again. Only God could do it. And buried in his heart is the plan to do what? Come into our world as one of us, humble himself, go to the cross and allow his evil world to kill him, the God and creator of this world. And by that death, beyond the comprehension of human mind, achieve what no human mind could ever have achieved. Defeat sin, 
Satan and death forever. What mind could not conceive, God has the power and wisdom to achieve. Do, do, do you see? And what God is saying to Job is, you hate evil, I hate evil. What makes me glorious is that I'll get rid of it. But don't dare suggest to me that you know how to do it, because you can't. But I do. In my secret counsels, I have planned and prepared the day when I will pay the price for you. Humble yourself before me. You have got no clue, but I do. There's no way humans could ever have come up with the cross. But God, the God of love and the God of power, uniquely had it all in hand. Trust him. Brothers and sisters, you see where this lands us? Oh, a bunch of things. The terrible arrogance of humans who say, if I were God, I would. He's doing it. How can I believe in God who lets and... You've got no clue how to deal with evil. But God does. To think that you could do a better job when God is the God of the cross, who has shown that he has power and wisdom beyond human insight. Do you see the wonder of this? Trust God. Humble yourself before Him. But let me give you finally, well, two things finally. Be astonished at this God, the God of love and the God of power, who used the cross, who, who, who rescued us from evil, never to come by the cross. Fall in wonder before this God. And third, last, whatever you're going through, whenever you suffer, remember the God of love and power, that you can trust him in the midst of it because he's working good in everything because he's a God of love. You don't know how, but that doesn't mean he's not doing it because he's God and you're not. Why don't you pause and let me stop you take a moment just to sit quietly and reflect. And I think the musicians are coming up, is that right? Yes, they are. Take a time, take time just to pause and think. Uh, think about the glory of the cross, the astonishment of who God is. Be humble before him. And let me pray. Heavenly Father, we, we ask, please, that you might help us see the, the wonder of who you are. That would please guard us from the foolishness of the world around us that imagines knowing better. Please help us see you for who you are, the God of power and wisdom and love. And let us entrust ourselves to you. We thank you for all you've done in the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.